All right, hey everybody, this is PJ Riley from Lancaster Archery 2023 ATA show in Indianapolis. This is a feature that we call a tech talk from Lancaster Archery. I, of course, am here with John <laughs> tech Dudley, talk. tech talk, who can talk a lot of tech. That's why we brought him in here. And uh, John, first off, thanks for sitting down with us. We sure appreciate Heck it. Heck yeah, <laughs> no place I'd rather be. I'm so in the hub of archery right here. This yeah, and this morning it was exciting. We got to see you launch the Unite. And this is something that has been in the works for years with you. Yeah, it, it actually has. Um, so several years ago, I'm doing this backstory just because there's the new like the integration part of compound bows right now, I know that's going. And uh, I would, I don't want to be accused of following. Um, <laughs> obviously, it's cool that the industry is accepting it. But um, so even before my first bow with PSE, I had made a drawing um, of this type of system on a bow. Yes. And it came to be because I was going to... Alaska and I wanted to be able to fully break down a compound bow to be able to put in a duffel bag right. for a, you know for like a super cub because like when I had it in there I'm thinking you know you have to like take you can only have 50 pounds right, right. so I was like if if there was a way to actually detach accessories from a compound bow it would be awesome but to be able to have the repeatability of an arrow rest and you know, even the sight, like I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of if I had a dovetail style sight, I'd never liked removing it. Like when I went to a target event, I would tighten it back on, yeah. I would re-sight in and make sure it's seated properly, but I wouldn't move it again. You know I mean? That would be, that would be it. Right. Um, so like even now on the hunting bows that have a big knob and a detachable extension sight, I like to take the knob, get rid of it, put the little stubby screw in, lock it in, and, lock it and in. don't move it. So I wanted something that was repeatable, and I was asking a buddy of mine who's like a sniper rifle specialist, is there a system to where you can totally take a scope off a rifle and put it back on, and it is still 100% dead nuts? And he's like, oh, yeah, yep. there definitely is. <laughs> And so we started talking about that, and I drew on a chalkboard. Well, I'll show you what it looked like. It, uh, my drawings were not awesome. <laughs> but So I drew on this on a chalkboard. <laughs> Do you see that? I see that. So I drew on a chalkboard. Show that to the camera. All right. So this was my drawing. And what I, what I wanted to do was make a system to where I could remove my rest, re remove the sight, and I actually had that same system down on my stabilizer, but I wanted to be able to like mount it back in, and th this this here we actually haven't done in the industry, but originally I wanted the Picatinny system machined into the riser, and then have a plate that was essentially an opposite Picatinny system to where you could then Put the plate on to have a flat surface again so if you wanted to use a regular sight or a regular rest you could do it right without having that so this was actually the very first drawing that i took to psc before the ntn came out and i said like hey if we could get you know a rest manufacturer and at this time it was aae because that's who i was using and nick's like yeah i'll do it you know i can make it that way then we talked about the you know, I actually called Spot Hog and talked to him about doing a, an extension bar that had the same thing to where it could be put into slots, right? Right. Well, when I went to PSE, they're like, no one is going to accept that. <laughs> so, I, you know, and I kind of didn't want to come out of the gate just with this whole new thing. Like, we're, what is this guy thinking? Yeah. So as soon as Matthews did it on the rest, I was like, <laughs> guys, <laughs> there's the beginning. I told you. <laughs> and, and, and the name Unite, um, the name we've, we've trademarked, and you'll actually find out it's been trademarked for a while. The name Unite was because I wanted United 
accessories to mount onto a bow system. Right. So that was originally the name and it was a little bit too extreme at the time. So we brought out the NTN, which was super solid, great shooter. Then I really focused on people with a budget. You know, the Embark was very yep. passionate to me for getting people into the into the archery world. And then the Levitate was, you know, my dream come true. And now we've we've circled back around. A lot of a lot of people have reached out and they're like, "Man, I love my NTN. I you know I love I love an aluminum bow. I like the extra weight. Some people do, and yeah. an extra weight is nice when shooting. You know, for TAC events or 3D, having a little bit extra mass weight is nice. And so it was time to bring out another flagship aluminum. So the Unite has now came forward a little bit different than how I, I drew it. I had to go with what the industry has accepted for the mounting system. Right. So, um, and you can detach it, you know, so you can yeah. you can have a front sight on a pick rail if you want, you can have a dovetail on the rear, or the riser thickness and everything is still made to where you can mount normal accessories and everything's gonna kind of be in its center line. But just to give you a, a I guess I should talk numbers. Yeah, go 32 ahead. 32 axle to axle, six and a half on the brace, uh, 338 for speed on the E2 cam. There's a new Easy cam, or it's technically called the the EC2, EC2. cam, which you know I'm I just call it the Easy cam because right. it's it's in a you know it's the original Evolve cam that everybody loved, but widened to the, to what I did with the Levitate. I mean, you know, I really wanted a wider mm-hmm. I wanted a wider cam platform because what's always weirded me out is when you can see axle flex. Is that weird you out? <laughs> so like I you always thought yeah. like widen the space and put a bigger axle in it and then we don't have something that's flexing like <laughs> that, you know. Yes. And then you have now this one does include the they call it the EZ220 forget the letters for it your spacer system oh in there. i don't know that system um it's I, a, well i know the system i didn't know yeah. there was a name for I, it it has a name and i keep forgetting because when we first talked about it it didn't have a name but now it does i think All it's right. the easy 220 but it's that spacer system that yeah. you can just pop those out it's much simpler it's not you don't have to take the axle off yeah i have to, to credit it. I have to credit the guys at PSE. I mean, they honestly, since the NTN, I was blown away at how fast the engineers could think, program, and and get a production model. I mean, it it was insanely fast. So one of the, I'll just be 100% transparent because I am one of the disagreements that I had with PSE was. I've never liked a cable rod that even has potential to be moved. Like, yeah. so the cable rod system for all the bows that we've done are, you know, they're they're put in where they need to be so right. that the cables are exactly on the inside of the riser. There's no ability for that to move. Now the the problem, and I shouldn't say it's a problem. What happened with that is the way they were. St- putting the spacers in their cams previously if you got a tear that didn't work out they just adjusted the cable rod to change the tear rather than break down you know break down the the cam out of the limb change the spacing yeah which to me once again it comes down to the fact of like i wouldn't have to move this if this was in the right spot so when i did the first bows, like even the NTNs, originally the Evolve cams were all shifted very far left in the system. And if people had that right tear, they would just shift the cable rod. Whereas I would break every bow down, pull the medium off the right next to the thick, move it over to the thin on the left, and I would have everything perfect. So for for me as a shooter, even as a target shooter, I could never shoot a system that looked wacky. Like it just, you know, because 
you do shoot arrows at a tournament, obviously, but you also spend a lot of time standing on the line, loading your arrow, looking at your bow. <laughs> and when stuff is out of place, it makes you think like, did that get moved or is that where it was? So I'll just show you here. Um, so like the other day, uh, so right, right here is a picture uh, signing off. So this was this is when I sent the engineers sign off Gen Seven of the Unite, and I pretty much sent them this picture. So if you're if you're looking, that's the picture I sent them right there. And if you notice that picture and you zoom in, you can see the arrow shaft string arrows running right down the centered machine marks in the riser. Yeah. So like there's you know that's kind of for just being able to see your center shot. My arrow shaft for a perfect, you know, tune and everything is running down the center of the tiller bolt. Yeah. Center of the stabilizer, and then the pin is sitting right on the, the inside of the outside edge of the arrow shaft. So to me, this represents a system that is not contorting at full draw. You know, right. so I already have the ability with my bow hand and facial pressure and all that i can already like i'm already going to screw this thing up <laughs> i don't want it screwed up to begin with so i'm just a, a fanatic that way of really wanting something that had torsional stabilities in fact like even back when i was at matthews all of my personal bows they actually all of my personal bows were shifted the grips were shifted over versus production models. The reason we didn't do it that way is because to have that extra thickness of the billet was like, you know, and, and because 90% of your billet goes into the garbage, into the recycle bin, yeah. it was like the cost of what, how much extra this bow would have to cost to everyone else buying it versus Dudley, you're being weird about what it looks <laughs> like. Um, I just feel like all that to me is important as a shooter. So right. these are all the very, very little methodical things that I think about. And that spacer system goes back to the fact of not everyone wants a cam or, or because of their hand pressure needs a cam exactly where it should be. And to be able to shim it and adjust it easily and not necessarily have to over yoke tune it, right. I think is critical. So they came out with this awesome system, and it's, I think it's close to two years that I've actually been working on that. If Occasionally there's Easter eggs, like in my social media, if you really look, you'll actually see bows that I've shot that had that on there that I wasn't talking about. Because one of my concerns was, you know, if you had a removable thing like that, how robust is it? You know, right. like, uh, and for me, um, it just, it's ingrained in me from when I worked under Matt, Matt was very, he really was adamant about cycle testing, cycle testing, cycle testing, and also dry fire testing as was Hoyt, you know, very like dr dry fire tests. Um, they were conscious of it. Yeah. So that was one of the things with me is like, eh, I don't know, like, how's this going to handle for like so we dry fire test it they're actually they go on in a place to where if it is dry fired that direction is going to where it would actually clip it on rather than pop it off type right. thing it's just small little things like that that a consumer doesn't think about these are all things on like why there's so many generations and why i'm methodical to bring it out but what i will tell you is I was, I was skeptical about that, but I'm also very convinced now, which I think is important to the people that follow us, yes. is they know that I'm like, I'm all in. I'm all in with this, this model. That's key because I can tell you when we first started talking about this system, people were like, that's going to fly out. Mm -hmm. But here you hear it. Yeah. John Dudley. I said the same thing. He says now it will not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what's cool about this system as well is one, the one thing it seems like no matter what bow I've ever had, like Eclipse seem like they've always been the wrong way to do it. 
like how many times I've snagged those on my pants or a sweater. Shot and, one across yeah, the room. Yeah, shoot them across the room. <laughs> Never fails. So the way this, have you pulled one of these apart? Yeah. Have you seen, it's I pretty have. cool, isn't it? It is. So you have like, you have a doll similar to what would be like a rocker doll on like, you know, say a Hoyt. There's essentially a doll that's going all the way through that limb. There's two sleeves that go on the end of that to where the limb butts up perfect. And then you put, you actually put two torques going opposing directions, you tighten them down. And what's really nice is for a boat, for a bow builder or especially a shop, if you need to swap out limbs or swap out a cam on a bow, you can actually tighten this system down and you can like set it down on the table and it's like taunt. You know, the limbs are not right. flopping all over the place. And when you actually go to clip it in place and assemble it, it's nice when things stay together. You know, it's For especially sure. with the pre you know, especially with certain bow presses and stuff that you gotta finagle with while you're going through that. So I just I really like those details and and in my opinion those little details um they're going to prevent a shop from having to like fully break down this bow for for an archery shop point of view it's super it's super good for saving time right right you know you're not having to you know pull them out and it always seemed like the super thin uh spacers were always the worst they were like the exact size to fall into the axle oh, slit to as soon fall as into you, the e-clip slit as on soon the as axle. you got the axle out those things went everywhere, everywhere. like yeah. oh man yeah. how many were there <laughs> so i mean we've we've addressed a lot of small details like that the the geometry of this is very similar to the levitate at full draw and so for me string angles at full draw are very critical because that determines technique you know if if, if string angle is super severe and sharp well now i have to have someone that is maybe overdrawn and a super short loop and that might affect the type of release that i put in their hand right you can't have that and someone wants a long neck release so i mean this the angles and the geometry really mirror that but as a consumer now there's two cam options. There's the E2 cam, and then the I call it the Easy Cam, but it's the EC2 cam. Yeah. And that one has a very smooth pull. Feels like the original Evolve. Um, what I'll tell people listening, if you're, I know a lot of people are like, when there's cam options, do I get the big one and be in the sl small slot? Do I need the small cam and the big slot? Right. What I will tell you is. The E2 cam is the most efficient cam I've ever tested. As you shorten the draw, the efficiency does not dissipate. Which like is usually what you expect. Yeah. yeah. Like, for example, on Hoyt's, you always knew if you were on a cam and a half system in the shortest slot, you'd be better off to go to the number two cam, put it in the longest slot. Right. This actually doesn't work that way. If you're in the shortest slot on an E2 cam, and you would be close to the longest slot on an S2 cam, there's only one foot per second difference in the two. The reality is, what does the consumer want? Some consumers love a shorter valley, you know, super bulletproof wall. They like to, they almost like to f fight their boat. You know, some people want a super dynamic back end, yeah, yeah. like ultra dynamic. I want a partially lazy back end, but me with a too. dynamic shot, you know? <laughs> um, so for me on the E2 cam, what I'll tell you is that module has settings. You know, you've got long, long slots on one side, short slots on the other. And if you think of it that way, A, B, and C, then you've got, you know, D, E in the middle, then it starts to fall off. The cam will feel the best for, if you want just a good feeling cam where you're, you don't have demand, it'll always be the best on either side of that slope. So if you're dead in the center of that cam module, it'll feel the most aggressive and aggressive probably isn't the best word. Cause I don't, I don't think any of them are like, they're not aggressive cams. Right. 
um, they might they might have a little bit tougher breakover. However, on the EC2 cam system, it actually is, if you can think of that module, I would say it's more shaped like this, where the harder part is in the A and B slots. And as you get away from A and B, it'll just get easier and easier and friendlier and friendlier and friendlier right. on an easy cam or an EC2 cam. So for me, this is a perfect example. If I shoot, this will go to 32 inches max draw with an E2 cam. A lot of times I'll shoot um, a 30 and a half for my hunting situation. So I can shoot this in a C position on an E2 cam and it feels awesome because it's, it's, it's on the down slope of where that cam feels good. Right. When I change this over to an easy cam for me and I have to shoot an easy cam in an A slot, you're you're really not gaining it's not actually easier it's just it's kind of the same in a different slot so what i'll tell you is if you're a shooter to where you're looking at the unite or if you're looking at any other the other p pse bows that have an easy cam option if you know you're going to be in a c or lower slot you will feel an easier experience than an E2 cam. However, if you're going to be in the A or B slot, you're probably going to be able to be in one of the other, you know, one of the other slots on an on an E2 cam to where it's it's going to feel just as good with a cam that will give you seven to eight feet per second more speed. So, yeah. if that helps, yeah. And as we were talking earlier about the brace height, the six and a half inch brace yeah. height, 338 feet per second, we were saying, you know, 10 years ago. We would have shot a crossbow impossible. with a 36 <laughs> inch power stroke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, and you know, people, yeah. I don't know if people appreciate the difference between six and six and a half and just how that feels and in terms of forgiveness. Hey, I'm probably as imperfect as anybody, and that's a big difference for me. Six inches, boy, I got to do stuff. Yeah. To me, it feels like, oh, if I make a little mistake. You know, it was surprising on the Levitate. When I got the Levitate and first started working with it, I never even checked because I was so focused on, on the DFC Carbon and, like, the feel of right. the shot i was very focused on that and then i was hyper focused on the fact of i always wanted a wider cam to where it would take up more of the space i mean that's what's nice about this there is not like in previous days there would be a ton of spacers yes in between that cam and limb yes and honestly you never knew which way to do it on some of the bows you could see flex in the axle um so i always wanted it wider just so that we could take that away so there was so much focus on the levitate on the cam system and how it felt when i shot that i just loved how it shot and it wasn't until we made the spec sheet to where i'm like wait a minute it's got a six inch brace height <laughs> and i was like that's too short and then they're like, okay, well, it's what you've had for a year. And I, and I was like, no, that can't be right. And then I measured and I'm like, it is. <laughs> but then when I, you know, drew it back, I'll put it on a draw board. I'll lay a piece of cardboard under it and then mark my string angles. You ever do that? Uh, yes. And then you can, then you can start drawing other bows Yeah. and, and look at your string angles and you start to realize like, okay, you know, cause some bows might have a bigger brace but if they're shorter axle axle the string angle string might angle. be sharper yeah you know so i was surprised at that because when i brought the ntn out i was adamant about a seven inch brace height which was always honestly that was always my favorite going back to like my 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 conquest my apex uh and then moving into like some of the pro elites right. i was always like chasing that that seven but the six in the levitate was not even a factor. No. 
and because there was not the, the other thing too is like with with limb angles and with string travel like brace height starts to you start to notice it when you have a lot of like over travel on limbs or over travel on string you just really don't have that on this system it's you know the limbs are really going against each other up and down it's dissipating you know the there's no jolt in bows anymore you know there really isn't I was part of the testing for Outdoor Life magazine when we were testing bows last year, which the Levitate, we picked that as our bow of the year, best yeah. bow of the year. And part of that, part of it was that I, my position was I felt like that changed what your expectations of carbon should be. For yeah. me, I thought that it just was not what you expected from carbon mm -hmm. but then it was a nice bow to shoot too. oh yeah yeah <laughs> like you said that six inch brace even though that is shorter and i tend to notice a difference i don't know i shot that bow well and yeah. we, our editor alex robinson he took that thing out 50 yards he robin hooded he's never robin hooded one before shot two of them inside out there with and as soon as he came back with that i was like uh he's gonna pick that one too <laughs> <laughs> well what's crazy is um so a week and a half ago i was hunting oh my gosh reuben ochoa uh i was hunting uh late season and it was minus 40 last week and or a week and a half ago so I'm, I'm like decked out in my fanatic set, you know, sitting in my, sitting in my blind and shoot a deer, you know, perfect shot with a six inch brace height bow. Yeah. Dude, there's no way I would have been able to shoot <laughs> bulky, heavy clothing with a bow with that brace height before. Right. You know, I just, th I just think things were so different and, you know, not everyone can afford that carbon the carbon price tag sure you know there's there's benefits to it but what i will say is the geometry of this is if you want to think of it this way because it doesn't appear this way and it doesn't it doesn't look this way and it you're probably not going to see it that way if you think of it but essentially this is a levitate built into a, an aluminum version it's just different in how it's laid out um, but you're actually getting a half inch more uh, brace height, but you're attaining the same speeds right. as where it was. So like, you know, even uh, the engineer Kevin, who I work with, you know, I personally always work with, with Kevin. Uh, Kevin was like, yeah, dude, crazy efficient. Yeah. Crazy efficient because to get that and to still be getting 330 with the previous cam system, look at what the NTN speeds were at a seven inch brace. Now we've only changed a half inch of brace, which should be three to four feet per second, right? But we're looking at two and a half times the output. So it's just a more efficient system. You yeah. know, you're, you're getting out even more than you put in which is pretty cool because I remember, honestly, I remember like five or six years ago uh, talking with like, you know, Zach Kurtzall and Darren Cooper, both, you know, cam designing geniuses. Uh, and at the time I was at Hoyt and I remember them saying like, just from an efficiency point of view, compound archery is almost like terminal velocity. You know, unless the only way you can really change it is if you reduce strand counts on strings. You know, if you lighten up strings, uh, you could change it. Shorten brace heights, you can change it. You know, you can you can still get some speeds, but it's not real. Right. You right. know, it's it's just fudging. You're sacrificing. Yeah, you're yeah. just kind of like fudging the cover. You know, to 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 show a number. So I'm, I'm really happy with it. I think it's a, a bulletproof, you know, aluminum bow. Feels awesome in the hand and, and is super accurate. So people sitting here listening and listening to you talk about this, and you know this bow inside out and backwards. It's clear that you're putting all this unbelievable thought into it. 
What does that mean for you that this stage of your career to be doing this? I mean, you're a coach, you know, you have the show and you go out hunting and all, but I can tell just listening to you talk about this, this is what you like doing. Well, I, I don't want to make anything that I wouldn't shoot. Right. You know, I just, I just, I don't, you know, I want to, I want to shoot it. You know, I want to shoot it. And, um, and it's it's honestly hard for me to put down a levitate because I I freaking love that <laughs> bow, I really really like it. But I also just like you know just like the year where I shot the embark, you know I shot I could have shot any bow that yeah. PSE made, but I shot the embark because I know there's people that only can spend seven hundred bucks on a bow. You know there's people that you know are gonna they're going to work a lot of OT to spend, you know, a thousand bucks on a bow. So I really wanted to make something to where if, if someone is like busting their nuts to be able to afford a bow and they pick this one, I want them to be like, this thing was freaking awesome. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I got, I got, I feel like I got more bang for my buck with what I, with what I picked. Right. That, right. That's really what I want. And I'm not a, Honestly, I've, I'm hardly educated in anything other than experience. Like, you know, I, I was not an engineer. I was not a trained engineer. I just, I am, have always been really weird about just watching people and being a stalker. So, you know, having, having spent 10 years of my life you know, around like Matt McPherson and, you know, Joel Maxfield and Gary Simons. And then another 10 years with Darren Cooper, you know, Daniel, Zach. I mean, you just, you listen to guys that are freaking geniuses and you start to, and I always ask questions like, Hey, I freaking hate why this thing looks like that. Why does it do that? So, I mean, there was a lot of I went to a lot of classes of asking a lot of questions to understand how it functions. And I've always, I've always been fortunate for, since 1998, I have been able to, to be shooting prototypes at least a year before people see them come out. And, you know, when I was, back at at Matthews there was a few of us myself and Brandon and Joel that set up bows and and shot bows to where Matt's like how does it shoot how does it tune and that was my job is it tuned and I was kind of the hundred yard guy you know that was what my role was was like hey here's what it'll do at a hundred yards and so that that's really all I still do now is I'm like how fast can I make this shoot a bullet hole? And uh, and honestly, I'm not sure if I have a picture of this, but like I have pictures that I send to the engineers to where it's pretty much my approval. Like that was the first shot with with the with the Gen Seven of the Unite. Yeah. First shot, eyeballing it with what I showed you, 90 degrees down the pipe was a bullet hole. The way the spacers came to me, which is how I kind of asked for them to come out of the box. Prior to that, um, with the the Levitate 2.0, uh, I actually built that bow with all three cam systems. I don't know if I have the picture close, but I built put I built it with all three cams. I balled three setups, and I got a piece of paper that had three perfect perfect bullet holes, and I just kind of said like, "Hey, this thing's." good to go and we had to change the limb pocket system and we went to the new axle system on the new 2.0 levitate yeah which is cool so yeah i don't know it's how is that for you being that you were the matthews 100 yard guy you go to all these tax you go to the tax every year to see people now at this day and age you know not that they're all driving tax but what they're able to do at 100 yards compared to yeah i could i could hire 1200 100 <laughs> yard people at a tack event <laughs> yeah it's it's really awesome because um not to throw all perfect shots but they can do a lot more now than they could 
well, like late '90s, early 2000s, um, Joel, Joel, like rigged up this crazy, like parts off some site to another site. We mounted them on Sherlock's to where we could have. We had four pin Sherlock's in in '97 and '98. We had four pin hunting sites jerry rigged on sherlock <laughs> supremes and yeah people would look look at you like you're an idiot when you're tra- saying i'm out practicing at 100 yards they'd be like what are you talking about yeah yeah now it's like i have gals come up to me and i'm like hey how long you been shooting for i've been shooting i don't know six or seven months and i'm like okay well we'll let these guys shoot here at 100 and then we'll move up and they're just like no i'm good <laughs> like okay here we here we go but that you know what that's a testament um that's a that's a really important topic because one of the things i'm a little bit bummed out about in our industry if i'm honest is every now and then i'll talk to a shop and i can sense animosity because they're like well, yeah, I used to have people that would come in and I worked on all their stuff and now they come in and they did their own this and they did their own that. And you're, you know, you think you're making everybody an expert. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make everybody stay in our sport. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. And the fact that I see 50 people on a weekend at a total archery challenge that are the grassroots to our industry, the people that that buy products from wherever they buy it, and I'm looking at them knowing that th- they have the ability to be every good as every bit as good as I was during my prime, and they've been shooting ten months. It's Dude, awesome. that is freaking awesome. Yeah, that is awesome because when when people are doing well at something, they keep doing it. If I mean, miss, who wants to suck at something yeah, forever? Right. You know, I like to suck at something long enough to get me, like, pissed off to where I get better at it. Yeah. And I'll, like, if I suck long enough at something, I'll figure out a way to get over a plateau. We want the easiest, most efficient learning curve to get people into archery as humanly possible. Yeah. That's what we, as an industry, that is what we should want. And when there's people getting information out there that can help them self-diagnose like i don't know if our industry would have got through covid if their ability to like turn on some videos and learn weren't wasn't an option right and if they were solely dependent on walking into a store that could have been a hard few years for our industry where we could have even lost people that we really that are veterans to our industry yeah so I, I think um, I think it's important. I didn't think the bow part would even be part of my equation, like as a person. Um, when I was in that contract phase, you know, and I, I and one of the things that PSC came forward to is like, hey, if you want your own bow, you could have it. And and truth be told, um, this this actually goes back five or six years ago someone came to me and they're like um hey did you see there's like a keep hammering bow and they go how do you not have a bow and i i just said well i have i've never asked for one and they're like well does it make you mad i go no good for cam he he asked for it yeah like good for him he he wanted he made it whatever he did to get his own bow he got his own bow awesome yeah like you know i it wasn't even on my map you know i never i never even thought that was a a thing you know my focus was in a very different place i was like hey uh good for him good for him for that and and i remember being at the i remember being at the innovation show when hoy introduced the bone collector model and that was like the big that was right at the beginning of the bone collector and i remember like going up to michael it was right before the innovation the doors opened to the dealers and i remember like kind of fist bumping michael and i go dude your freaking name's on a bow (laughs) 
<laughs> and he's just like, like he looked at me like, he's like, can you freaking believe it? And I was like, this is so cool. Like freaking yeah. this guy, I mean, at the time, all three of them, but like, you know, Michael freaking went over a major hurdle of like becoming a major face of Realtree when there was already major faces there. Yeah. And then brought a team in with him that, you know, and they're all still together, which is super impressive. Yep. So I was like, hey, freaking good for the people that did it. Yeah. You know, they, they wanted it. They paid the dues that they had to do to get it. And when I knew that I was kind of a free agent, so to speak, when PSC said, hey, if you want to do a bow, we'll give you an engineer and you can just do whatever you want. I kind of, I, it's not what I wanted at first, yeah. to be honest with you. And then I started thinking like, well, if I did one, what would that be? So the last four years have kind of just been things of like, what am I passionate about right now? Right. You know, which is awesome. And if I don't bring out something, I don't get heat. You know, they're just, they're, I really do have the flexibility to do what I'm what I'm passionate about, what I'm being driven towards. So I'm pretty I'm pretty pumped too. I got I got the same <laughs> face Waddell has. I'm I'm freaking smiling right now. Like yeah, that's pretty awesome. What's awesome to me is that I'm actually able to shoot something that I almost feel like. I can make it shoot better because I have so much belief in it. For that's sure. All, that's always very hard for shooters. You know, I always wonder how many of our of our great pro archers, how much better they could be if they didn't have to change some years. Because, because like, <clears throat> you know, if you look at, like, when Jeff Hopkins was just dominating 3D back, you know, when I started – 3d or or actually go 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 pre let's go pre hopkins let's go to ulmer you know when ulmer had that freaking browning bow that was cobbled together and just was dominating people he just kept shooting that thing and there was like it's not like browning was at the 3d events like putting pressure on him to like there weren't bringing out target new target bows every year he just had Pro this comp. bow that shot good, and when he showed up with that <laughs> sucker, like you were hoping he didn't have a freaking day like he normally did. Yeah. And then when Hopkins got on a roll with that freaking bear Omnistar or whatever the hell he had, he freaking dominated with that thing. And then when Dave Stepp came in with the single cam high country that he freaking cobbled together, you know, first guy to win six figures in a year shooting a bow and he just like there was a time where people weren't having to change all the time they were they were actually like cobbling stuff together that like suited them yeah it worked and their style because honestly all three of those guys i just mentioned had very different techniques and they were able to make something work that they put together and not have to change like for a target archer a target archer Part of the reason why I left target archery is because it really restricts your hunting season because you have to be, you better be 60 days into training right now, prepping for a Lancaster classic. Like you can't get done with my late season hunt two weeks ago and be ready for <laughs> Lancaster. Yeah. Like you not, not when there's people there that don't miss and that don't hunt and they've been doing it since yeah. August when everyone else stopped, they just kept practicing, <laughs> kept practicing. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think, um, for me, I'm lucky to be kind of my best self right now. I feel like I'm better at 46 than I was in my thirties for sure. But I think it's because I'm also not feeling forced to shoot something that I didn't have part of. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Well, what do you want to talk about, PJ? You just I, I let me ramble about. I, absolutely. I just like sitting here and listen because I like listening to people. You know, this is what I do. I interview people. And I can just tell 
by the level of detail that you're going into that this is something that you really are into you love it you know I watch your videos I, I see your teachings and stuff like that but this is a different level of that passion in archery you know? yeah um, and it's just cool I, I I just like to sit it, and listen. It is cool. <laughs> you know, to be fair, to be 100% fair, um, like even when I'm very, very thankful for PSE, I'm very thankful, you know, that Pete made that happen because obviously like this would have never been part of my life's journey without PSE. It would have never happened. It, it, you know, me doing that sort of thing with any other company just wouldn't, just doesn't fit the other companies you know just their strategy right um but what i will say is there's there this is an awesome year for amazing products in our industry um you know i i've a lot of other brands send me stuff and and ask my opinion and there is no better time to be a consumer in archery than 2023 I can tell you that, that right now. Is for sure. There is some really, really freaking awesome gear. No doubt. I mean, it's hard to, I guess, beat when we've already got perfect scores in target archery. But I certainly think there's going to be, wor- like, personal records. This 2023 will go down in history for personal records for people that are beginners all the way up to pros there is nothing holding us back from an equipment point of view in our industry from being the best we can be yeah and and i guess my biggest passion way way more so than bows is to make people the best archer they can be like that's that's a hundred percent my drive is to just i want to just teach you know, I, I just like, even with this, I told them like, you guys are cramping, like you're cramping into my freaking <laughs> content time here. Um, because I, I, I have a goal, um, you know, last year, last year, um, last year I did just over 200 videos for 2022. This year I'm going to, I'm going to do 300. Um, nice that's where my passion is and these are just tools that let me get there yeah you know and you guys are too i mean Lancaster, i've you guys have been an awesome partner with me since i mean i don't even hey rob hey rob there he is how long have we like been together bro <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't even like the first lancaster trailers that i remember like being there with like Bill Scott on one side and like Scott Slates on another side. Like, how when was that? Like mid nineties. Yeah, this is early to mid nineties. So we're talking thirty years. Me and you know Rob have like yeah been seeing this stuff. There's no better time in the industry, and you know it's so cool that it's so cool. Like Lancaster has literally fought and ground to like become the leader in target archery and to always support it and then like crossed over into like the hunting world and it's just so cool that there is crossover now between really good target archers and what that means to make really really good bow hunters and the bow hunters becoming more educated yeah (laughs) yeah there there's like it's like there's we're we're finally archers you know we're not bow hunters and target guys we are archers. That's what our community is. Bow hunters can shoot freaking good. There's honestly, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of European pro target shooters specifically that are like open minded to hunting and being like, dude, I love the idea of knowing where my food comes from. Yeah. It's like these brands are, are the segue for those things to cross over. And that's the lifeblood to our industry. Like that's what's gonna keep this industry is around is for there not to be a, a division within our own community. You well, know, it's not like bow hunter target archery. Yeah. Public land, private land. 
like all those are a line in the sand to where we should all just be like let's all live the beach life man let's just walk <laughs> the whole thing we don't we don't need lines in the sand well you talk about the educational portion of it and so rob Who's going to hire a guy like me in archery? What what am I going to do in archery? But his idea was, hey, let's educate people. All these products here. How do you get them to people who aren't here? Yeah. That was his idea. And just said, hey, come in, show them what it looks like, tell them all about it, and hey, maybe that sparks interest, you know? People see this stuff. So, yeah, it's just been great. John, we always appreciate having you around. It's always good to talk to you. Thank you, my man. I appreciate it. Love it. We're excited to see the Unite out and about and see people getting their hands on this and shooting it. And uh, we're just excited for 2023. So awesome. (laughs) See you, everybody.